Okay, so today we are going to apply the ornstein ulenbeck process to model pair straightening. Okay, um, does anyone have any like ideas on like some equations you can model stock prices? Like, oh yeah, um, if, every, if anyone wants to speak, feel free to unmute yourself and say something. <laughs> like, okay, so here's uh, some ideas. Like, you can try to model. Okay, you can try to model stock prices with like y equals x squared. Does that make sense? No. Y equals x. Like, that doesn't make sense either. Like, because stock prices are usually like this. Like, y equals like x zero plus like like some constant times. Some like constant times x1 plus like none of these models like can really capture like a stock price movement that looks like this, right? So how can we model this type of movement? And the way we can model it is with an Ornstein Ulenbeck process. So uh, let's start with uh, what typical Brownian motion is. And Brownian motion is like just basically random movement around here. And some, so it is like a concept from physics and the motion tends to like pass through zero a lot. And the spread is usually like with a Gaussian distribution. So these points would usually look like this when you plot the histogram of the uh, points. <clears throat> okay, so this isn't very good for modeling stock prices because well, stock prices usually don't just go back to zero, like repeatedly go through zero and go. Stock prices usually don't look like that. They usually look like this. So instead, we could modify the Brownian motion slightly and we get something like this. And so it is a, the ornstein yulebeck process is a type of Brownian motion that reverts to some mean over the long run. So it could look like this. And so, and it also accounts for the weird noisy movements, which is really nice because stock price data usually is very noisy, right? And so, so we can model the stock, okay, so we can model um, stock prices as a Ornstein Udling process. And we can just do it with some three parameters, uh, theta, mu, and sigma. Okay, so we're, yeah, okay. Um, we're actually, well, to be exact, we're not actually gonna model like the price of one stock, but instead the price of a pair trade. And for you who don't know, a pair trade is going long on one stock and going short on another stock in an attempt to like um, profit from like the spread. Like you think that they'd converge. So say you have like, can someone give me some examples of some stocks that tend to move very closely together? You can type in the chat or me, Mike. Like just give me like two stocks. So what are some like company? Yes, they're usually in the same industry. Uh, yeah, that's a good. That's a good example. Like Apple, Google. The most classic example uh, people know about is Pepsi and Cola. They basically sell the same thing, and so they're highly correlated. So the intuition is that when the price of cola stock goes up and the price of Pepsi stock doesn't go as high up, you'd think that eventually their prices would converge because they're basically the same industry. They're like, they're both soft drinks. So they are affected by, by the same economic, macroeconomic factors, the same consumer preferences, all these things. So you'd think in the long run, the prices would converge. 
And so what you can do is you can take the difference of like some, you can take some like $1 stock, you can take like $1, $1 of Pepsi, right? Uh, uh, Pepsi, Pep. So you can take like $1 Pepsi and then you can, and you go long on it. And then you can short $1 of Coca-Cola. And you could expand the spread to like, um, you can expect the spread to like have some weird motion, but <clears throat> so it's probably look like this. Like you try to profit from, you try to buy here and you sell here. Well, in, you can, another thing you can do is actually is buy $1 Pepsi and short half a dollar of Coke. So we aren't limited to like equal dollar amounts of each. So what we are going to do is take two ETFs, GLD. Can someone guess what kind of ETF that is? Like just add a letter and you can get what it tracks. GLD. Does anyone have a guess? What does it sound like if you like try to say GLD? Or you can Google it here. Uh, here, you guys get, okay. So another ETF we're gonna track is SLV. <laughs> Okay, how about you guys like search Google it and like type in the chat. This is a uh, part of the research process is being a good Googler. Cause uh, to be honest, like the thing is like, I can't know all of this. Like, I don't know all this when I'm born, right? I have to research this stuff. So you guys research what GLD stands for and what SLV stands for. Uh, let's take a long. Okay, so let's see what GLD is. Yeah, let's figure out. Gold Trust. It is a gold tracking ETF. And an ETF is basically. <laughs> okay, it's fine. Uh, so GLD is a gold tracking ETF. And an ETF is basically a. It's like very similar like to a stock. You can buy and sell on the stock market. And so what they do is they have like this vault of gold and they have this ETF like that sort of like tracks the value of gold. So this ETF is backed by gold. And so you'd, you'd hope that this moves with the price of gold because it is backed by gold. And SFV is the same, basically the same thing, but instead of gold, it's with silver. So do you guys think these two, I mean, so you think these two would pr move pretty similarly, right? Because they're both precious metals and they'd probably both do very well in an economic downturn as people may lose trust in the dollar and gold tends to retain its value over time. Well, that's actually debatable, but <laughs> we'll save that for another time. So what we can actually do is we can keep track of holding what our uh, keep track of holding one dollar of GLD and some like uh, like negative some dollars. This is shorting like 0.5 dollars of SLV. And so what happens is the price sort of looks like this, and it sort of looks like a Ornstein Unibank process, right? And so what we want to do is we want to get these coefficients. Yeah, I'll explain what these coefficients mean. And we want to get these coefficients for the portfolio value, the value of holding $1 of GLD and some negative allocation of SLV. Okay, so um, here's theta. Uh, okay, so theta is like the mean. So if you take out the average of these values, like roughly it is equal to theta. So this would be around theta. And mu is how fast a point goes back to the mean. So like, yeah, let's see the equation.
Okay, so intuitively, if you have a point that is far from the mean, then you have this coefficient that multiplies it, and then you go back to the mean very fast. And the larger this is, the faster you go back to the mean. Think about it. Like, so say, okay, so let's just say our mean is, uh, Okay, so say, say we have a graph that looks like this, and the mean is like around one. And so you can take this difference and you can like have a force back on, back towards you. So you have like a force. So this difference, you use that as a factor to determine how fast it goes back down. But if you're like here, the distance is very small. So the tendency to go back down is not as big. So what, it, so what we do is we take the distance at our current location and we subtract it from the long-term mean and we multiply it by some factor to get us back to the mean. And so what happens, so if you think about it, the larger the theta, if theta goes up, then the mean, then the fat, then the force pulling us back down is greater. It's greater. Okay, so what does sigma mean? Okay, so we've covered. So so we've covered. So let's just say so the mu, the force going back down or up here can go up. This force is the degree at which we return to the mu is theta, and so what is sigma? Well, in statistics, sigma stands for standard deviation. And so it basically tells us how noisy our data is. So like this is very noisy, right? So if we had a lower sigma, it looked a lot more smooth. Like this would be so high sigma, and this is lower sigma. Okay, so does that make sense? The, the, does anyone have, does any of this part not make sense? Like, do, okay, hopefully this all makes sense. Oh shoot. Okay, that's good. Okay. Okay, so how do we, so how do we estimate like theta, mu, and sigma? That sounds like, like, you have like this random moving thing, so how do we, get these coefficients, theta, mu, sigma. Like, how do we get these? Like, this is some weird, this is like some weird moving thing. So, so what we do is we use maximum likelihood estimation. That is one method of getting these coefficients. Okay, so that's our first goal. So let's write that down. Okay, so our first step, our first, okay, no, steps. Solving. So let's think of this as a problem. So our first step is to get the S to find these estimate the OU and OU stands for or to yeah. Okay, so let's um so let's talk about okay so we can go over that okay so let's lay out the second step so say we have this uh will the note be shared later um it's all on that uh yeah i can share that later i'll uh post it in the video's notes also like these a lot of these have like all the steps that we have usually need. Let's look at this algorithm. All right. Okay. Uh, I actually have a write up. So what I do is at Quant Connect is I uh, once I create these strategies, I write up how to how to implement these algorithms like step by step and. Uh, 
like it may take a week or two to like get it onto our website, but uh, I can post it. I can also post that along with the video. Okay, so okay, so this is our portfolio. Say okay, so let's just say we are buying once we are buying and holding one dollar of GLD. And if you remember, GLD is our uh, is our goal tracking ETF, and we short half a dollar of SLV. Okay, these numbers actually don't really matter. And this is the value of our portfolio, right? Okay, so let me mark a few, few points. Okay, so let one, two, three, four, five. Okay, at what points do we buy? At what points do we want to buy? Okay, does anyone know the secret to making money in the stock market? Uh, it's four words. It's, it's, it's sort of a meme. Uh, yeah, you got half of it. What's the second half? Buy low. Yes, yes. So what we want to do is buy low, sell high, right? Okay, so where do we want to buy with this strategy? Okay, so I have five points here. Where do we want to buy and where do we want to sell? Yes, that is, yes. Okay, so the good points to buy is one and four and a good place to sell is three. Okay, so how can we determine at what points? How can we determine these buy and sell levels? And that is where we get to the second part of our problem, the optimal stopping problem. Okay, I should probably just take it. Okay, so our second step is solve the optimal stopping problem, which gives us the best prices to buy and sell. This way, we can buy low, sell high. Okay. Okay, so what, however, what is, what might be a problem? So, okay. Uh, so let's say our, let's say like, it looks like this. Okay, so, so do you lose, so say you buy a stock and it doesn't go anywhere. Do you lose money? Like, say you buy a stock at $10 and it stays $10 for a year. Do you lose money? You know, uh, I don't care. You know, don't be afraid to be wrong, guys. Just give your opinion. So you buy a stock, buy a stock, buy a stock at $10. It stays ten dollars, stays ten dollars for a few years. Do you lose money? You lose purchasing power. How about this? Purchasing power. Okay. Yes, good. That's the answer I was looking for. You lose money because of something called inflation. So the bank prints money. Like, if you know about J-PAL, here, J-PAL, <laughs> pretty funny. Yeah, this is documentary, this is documentary of the Federal Reserve. It's pretty accurate. <laughs> okay, so what the, so the banks print money every year. 
And with more money, the supply, as there's more something, the less value it is. So, and this process is called inflation. Okay, so what this means is buying at this point might not be optimal because if we hold it for so, if we have to wait so long for it to dip to the bottom, um, we might just lose money because uh, like the potential profits don't cover the loss of money because of the time value decay. So what we, so like, in, this might be like a good entry point. And so uh, like in the equations here, let's see the paper. I actually don't know if this, right. Okay, so the the bunch of so the equations for solving the optimal stopping problem they have to account for the lost money from time going forward because of inflation and so that is why buying at the very lowest and selling at the very highest is not always optimal hopefully that makes sense Okay, um, so the okay, so let's talk about the optimal stopping. Uh, I'm just I'm just throwing it around, but let's explain what it is. So one of the most famous problems within the optimal stopping uh, world is the secretary problem. So say you can hi so say you have like a hundred secretaries, and the rule is once you interview a secretary, um, you have a choice. You can either hire him or her or go to the next candidate. And you can't go back to an old candidate and hire them. So, how, but the thing is, <clears throat> um, spending time and money, no, spending time and resources on hiring a secretary costs money because you have you spend some time of your employees to within the hiring process. You have all the advertising through things like Glassdoor, LinkedIn. So it costs money. So how do we know when to stop looking for new candidates? Well, apparently the equation is you look through one divided by E of the candidates so one divided by E. And so that is basically 37%, around 37%. So if you had 100 candidates, you'd look through the first 37 candidates, and then you take the next candidate, and if that candidate was better than all the previous candidates, then you have a 37% chance that that candidate will be the best candidate out of all of them. It's pretty interesting. Um, here, it's a very similar problem. We can't, we know. Uh, actually, is it? So here, we want to derive the optimal times. So, in, so what we do, instead of uh, looking at secretaries, we use the coefficients of our ornstein ulebeck process to derive these price levels at which we buy and sell. Freedom UC. Okay, here, let's look at the paper to really see what I mean. So, so here, you know, the portfolio values of buying some amount of, buying $1 of GLD and shorting some amount of SLV. So you can see here, it's not pretty. It doesn't look like some like polynomial. It looks very, has a little bit of noise. And here, you can see here, it's very light, but the dotted line here is the optimal to buy it, accounting for the, um, <clears throat> accounting for the time value of money. So here, it is very close to the bottom, but it's not the very bottom. 
So you buy here and you sell here. Okay, so what we want to do is derive these levels at which we buy and sell a portfolio. And that is the optimal stopping for, that is the optimal stopping problem for our case. Um, that's, and then after that, uh, so, so our third step is to buy at the optimal entry and sell at the optimal exit. Okay, so let's go through the first step. Um, Okay, so we have an equation here. This is what we're trying to maximize. So maximum, lock, uh, maximum likelihood ex estimator, what we basically try to do, what we basically try to do is find some coefficients that maximize this value, maximize this function. So say we have like some, uh, say if we change mu, if we increase mu, we want to keep increasing mu until uh, our this equation uh, returns the max value. Uh, so for each of the co so, so let's look at what that looks like. Okay, so say we have a coefficient. So it usually looks like this. So let's say the y is equal to the MLE maximum likelihood equation function. And this, and on the x-axis, we have some uh, OU coefficient, uh, let's say mu. It usually looks like this. And we want to take the value, mu value here, and we keep that number. And so we basically do that for all three coefficients. And that's good. Um, okay, so. So what? So the first thing we actually do is we so we take one dollar. Yeah, let me go through something. Okay. So what I'm gonna. He's gonna take a while. Uh, so the first thing we do is we take one dollar. Uh, yeah, let me check my mail real quick. Sorry. So first we take one dollar of GLD, and then we take. So for, okay, so the first thing we do is we take one dollar of holding GLD, and then we take. Uh, negative point zero zero here according to the paper we take point zero zero one dollar of SLV and short it and then we compute and then we have the portfolio of it over time and that's like an array like think of these so a portfolio, so say these are some portfolio, okay, never. So say we have like a portfolio value. Okay, so that's what it looks like. So it could be like zero. I mean, that's probably actually. It could be like one, then four, then negative one, uh, three, two, like, so th th it sort of represents this portfolio. And so what we want to do is we want to take these values and fit it to the maximum likelihood estimation. Um, okay. So let's look what uh, what TS. Okay. Let, okay. Let's go over this. So Quantbook is like an object that allows us to gather data. So this is Quantbook. 
It's just a built-in quant connect method. Then I add GLD and I add SLV. That basically makes me be able to pull data from it. And QB that security is like keys, that's GLD and SLV. So I could literally change this to uh, GLD SLV. Um, so pull data, pull historical data, and I get OHLCB data from this start date till this end date on a re daily resolution. So you can have hourly resolution, so you get hourly bars, you can have minute resolution, you get minute bars. But I choose, so, but we are using daylight data. Okay, so let's look at what. Okay, so it's a bunch of just prices, right? And what we can do is we can subtract. So what we do is we can take TS, TS, what, dollar. ILOC stands for integer location. So we take the first price value and let's see what it looks like. So we start out with so basic uh it's kind of weird, but so we start out with like one dollar goes here, and so this is the port full this is the value we have of holding g l d if we invested one dollar into g l d and Let's see the value. So let's see. <clears throat> okay, so what we can do is we can take TS one. Uh, so let's do the same thing for SLA. And so what we do, how do we measure a portfolio value of holding $1 of GLD? So we can do, is we can take $1, of, so this is, so TS GLD1 is the represents holding $1 of GLD. And what happens, how do we short, how do we represent short? So we subtract and we can do 0 0.01 times TS SLV1. Let's see, okay, let's see. Looks like that. How about let's get, and let's scale it up to how about let's scale it all the way up to one. And so it's, so what we do is we iterate from 0 0.01, then 0 0.02, 0 0.03, for this coefficient of shorting TSLSLV, and we compute the maximum log, li log likelihood. Then we choose the value here, the allocation to shorting TS SLV. We choose this value that maximizes this equation here. So we're just kind of doing two maximizations. Okay, does it make sense? And the reason we want to maximize the log likelihood is because the higher the log likelihood, the higher the probability our values can be modeled as an ornstein uhlenbeck process. Okay, so say you had like some Okay, so say you had like something like this. It's like very. It's like a squared function. Our maximum likely, log likelihood might be very low for this, because it does not represent an uh, ornstein ulebeck process very well. But what happens if we had something like this? Then it'd be probably like a lot higher. It'd be way higher than this graph. 
right? Because this looks more like an ornstein ulamper process. So what we do is we choose a bunch of allocations to hold sh the shorting of some amount of SLV to give us a portfolio value that most class closely matches an ornstein ulamper process. Does that make sense? I believe that makes sense. Okay, so once we have, so once we are on a specific um, allocation to shorting SLV, like 0 0.01, how do we find the, uh, the OU coefficients? Okay. Um, so before I go into that, I just wanted to talk about uh, the coefficients. So er, I was talking about how mu is the long-term mean and theta is like how the strength that at which the process goes back to mu and sigma is the noise in the data. However, in the paper, theta is the long-term mean. I don't know why. Don't ask me. Uh, it, Theta is the long, so it's kind of weird. Yeah, I can even. Uh... So you can see here, like, let's just compare. You... you see that? That was a hack I did. It's a Windows left key for those interested. You can make it half. Let's compare the equation side by side. Do you guys see? Uh, so what the paper does is it switches the mu and the sigma around. It, it kind of got, like when I was developing this strategy, it kind of got me, but I got used to it. So. Now, think of theta as the long-term mean. Uh, long-term mean. Mu is the strength, is the uh, Okay. Now let's continue. So he Okay, so here you can see the equation. So sigma tilde squared. Let's put this in Zoom in chat. Okay, so you can you see here, negative uh, log of 2 pi. Uh, just, as, just for you to know, in Python, log stands for the nat uh, defaults to the natural log. And so you can just basically see this log as ln. So, well, instead of doing negative 1 half times log of math is 2 times pi, I just take the negative log then of 2 pi, then divide by 2. It's basically the same thing. Then we take the negative log of the square of sigma tilde squared. And we have sigma tilde squared here. So I, I just basically copied the equation down uh, exactly, but just made it Pythonic. Sigma squared, one, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you don't understand these equations, don't matter. The thing about quantitative finance is sometimes you don't need to understand how to derive these equations and stuff like this. Honestly, I'll be honest. I don't understand how they came up with all these numbers either. I mean, all these like symbols and equations either. But the thing for quantitative finance is there's always the supply of super smart people who are putting out these papers. So our job as quants 
is to implement these papers in code. It's not black box. We just, it's not black, I mean, <laughs> like we just, we just, we just don't need to, we don't understand, I don't understand it and we don't need to understand it. What we need to do, need to do is be able to understand how to implement this code. And so we, and then we iterate. So it's basically the same thing. For our i to n, here you can say i, well, n here is the length. So big X is the array of all the small x values, and n is just equal to the length of the big X, which is the number of small x values. So for our i and it's x of i, you can see x of i minus x minus one, blah, 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 blah here. Okay, so we have an equation here, right? And basically, it's just this equation. We give it a, uh, some params, and our params, we pass in theta mu sigma for the params. Args, okay, so the reason we have it formatted like this is because we're going to pass it to a scipy optimized function. So uh, that's basically why. Um, yeah, I explain it here. And so what SciPy does is they um, put a bunch of random theta values, put a bunch of mu values, and put a bunch of sigma values to minimize this value. And so how can we minimize something? Wait, oh, yeah, it kind of showed. How can we minimize something? How can we maximize something using a minimize function? Think about it. Does anyone have an answer? How can we maximize a value, but we can only, but our function only minimizes? What operation can we do to our value that we want to maximize? Come on, any guesses? Give it uh, 10 seconds, 10. Okay, to maximize a value when we only have the minimize function, what we do is we take the negative of it. So let's think about it. So say we have a function. This is some negative x squared, negative x squared plus some um, blah, 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 right? So, and we have to minimize, we have a min function. So how can we, but this is here is the maximum. So how do we find it? So if we take the negative of this, we get this, right? This is a negative. So let's say this is f of x. This is negative f of x. And so what we do, we find the min here. And this min, the x value for this min is the max for this. Well, it doesn't align, but <laughs> like the same like the x value. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so in summary, to maximize the value, you only, only have the minimize function. You take the negative of the value, and when you minimize the negative of a value, you get the maximum. Okay, so we should basically have this equation here set up just just to return this value. Okay, so you might be wondering, so that's cool, but how do we find theta, mu, and sigma? We have this equation, like what values do we put in? Like, what do we do? And that is where scipy minimize comes in, the function. Okay, so um, for the process, for to standardize things, Theta can be any th real number. Let's think about it. So say our mean, so theta is our mean, right? So theta. Theta, this is one valid theta. But this is also one valid theta. And here theta 
is below zero and it is negative, right? So what that means is theta can be any real number. It is not restricted to positive or negative. But for the sake of consistency, what we do is we make sure the force pulling best, like pulling us back down, this is always positive. The coefficient of the force pulling us back to the long-term mean, it is always positive. And this noise, the noise you can see here, like this noise is always positive as well. However, SciPy does not allow us to you like SciPy limits are always like square brackets, you know, it's inclusive. So none means infinity here. So none means there's no upper bound. So SciPy bounds are always like this, right? So how do we get so how do we get this? So what we do is we give it some low, very low, small number. We give it some very small number like this. Like, what if our uh, mu and sigma like are uh, smaller than 0 0.0001? Well, that is very unlikely, so we don't have to deal with it. Usually sigma, so usually mu is around like five to 15. And sigma is usually like 0 0.005 to like 0 0.5, right? So what that means is it doesn't really matter that like, it doesn't matter if we're using a small value because like it's usually too small for our mu and sigma anyways. So that so one e five negative five basic is basically um, one. It's scientific notation. Okay, uh, let's add a code. It is one times 10 to the negative fifth. See, yeah, it's just scientific, it's just, it's just a different, like it's just shorthand scientific notation. Okay, so these are our bounds. And so what we give, so what we do is we give our scipy these bounds to make sure that we don't get like a value we don't want. However, so we do not want negative values for mu and sigma, right? So we pass it in here. Um, so here I just, so theta is like the long-term mean. So what I do, it's like, so it is roughly the mean of the value. So I just take the mean here and that is our initial guess. I don't know, I, and I put some numbers here. It can, honestly, these can be anything. And these are initial guesses. And once this function is minimized, or like basically, but since we are taking the negative this value, we find the maximum of this. Once that function is maximized for us, SciPy gives us the values back. The uh, initial, so we have three here. We want to find the theta, mu, and sigma. And so our initial guess should have three values. Our initial guess is for theta mu sigma. And so here we get the values and maximizes our maximum likelihood estimation function. And we get the max log likelihood here. And we keep this because we want to compare the different allocations of shorting the uh, SLV. Uh, so we can find the max then we can find the allocation of shorting SLV that maximizes this value. Okay, so here's should, if you guys remember earlier. If you guys remember he, her here earlier, so we take the first value. Oh, hopefully you guys remember, yeah? and we take some like negative allocation. So, how, so how do we find the optimal uh, allocation for shorting B? Uh, let's find it. Okay. 
here, argmax b alloc. So argmax basically gives us the b argmax basically gives us like the code unquote, like sort of the index value of the max value. And since we are trying to find the um, the largest maximum likelihood of estimation value for the allocation of shorting some allocation of B. Okay, uh, I forgot to mention, but like B alloc stands for the ratio that we apply to sh the shorting of the SLB. So we initialize, so what we do is we, so, so mp.lun space, let's look at what it does. So it gives us a, like it gives us a bunch of like small values between 0 0.01 and one, and how many values we want in between, equally spaced values we do want. You can see there's a bunch of values between zero and one. And so what we do is we go through all these values, we calculate, <coughs> uh, we calculate the compute coefficients for it. Uh, so we will like basically send this into the function, like each value gets plugged into this function. And so we find the argmax. <clears throat> and, uh, oh yeah, this also keeps track of the theta mu sigma, you can see here. Okay, so this actually like returns, if you remember, uh, theta mu sigma max log likelihood. So at the zeroth index is theta, this would be theta. And this is mu, this is sigma, and this is the allocation we should allocate to B. Okay, so let's see an action. So we have the data, okay. And this way we get first step. And uh, okay, so while it's calculating it, do you guys have any questions? How about this? Uh, I'm not, you guys can like this might take a while because it does a lot of computations. You guys have any like questions about me or like questions about the club or questions about like anything about algorithmic trading? Feel free to like ask me anything <laughs> at this point while we're waiting for these values. Actually, we don't have to calculate these values. Okay, so the paper already calculates the values for us. And it's here, well, so let's just skip that step. Well, let's just continue on. Okay, so R stands for, okay, so R stands for what the investor thinks the time decay value of money is. Um, so what common value might be 3%? Because the value, because the rate of inflation is 3%, right? And C stands for like the cost of transaction. So what we could do, now we need to, okay, so now we are moving on to the second problem of solving the optimal stopping problem. Okay, so the, uh, so say we have like some portfolio of going long $1 GLD and shorting, I can't remember. I think it's around port four. No, I actually do derive it. I actually have it here. Okay, so this is, okay, if you guys remember, wait, no, this is for something else. 
Okay, so say so like say we are like going long on one dollars of GLD. So hold uh, this is our portfolio. I, I I can't remember the exact values. So say we have these portfolio values. Okay, so how do we determine the optimal time to enter this port? So we don't actually want to like enter a this portfolio immediately so we can keep track of it like what it would be worth but think about it so say our portfolio is up here we do not want to enter here so we're going to find the optimal values to enter and the optimal values to exit and as i said earlier this is the optimal stopping problem so how do we solve this well, good thing the paper solves it for us. It is quite complicated. So let's just go through this paper. Look at all this stuff. Like, I try to, like, a lot of this doesn't make sense. Well, it does make sense, but not to me, because I don't understand it. But the power of being a quant is we don't need to understand it. We just need to literally copy down what the paper, how the paper solves the problem. We don't need to do the intermediary steps. We just take the final solution and we just calculate the values with our programming skills. So we have a bunch of this, but let's focus on what the most important part is. So to solve the optimal stopping problem, I've, I've done this beforehand. We need this equation. We need this equation. And so I have it represented here, f of x, Okay, so how do you take the integral? There's a SciPy method called, there's a quad. Don't ask me why it's called quad, but it's basically integrate. So we take a function that we want to integrate. So like, so like given, so given a u, this is what our function, if we plug u into this function, along with these, these are constant though. So I just basically copied over. So you see here, here, we integrated from zero to infinity. I just basically copied what the paper did. Here, same thing. It looks very similar, but you can see here the order of theta and x are reversed. You can see theta and x are reversed. So I just basically copied the paper, copied the question paper and made it Pythonic. Does this make sense? Does does all of this make sense? Does anyone have any questions about how to enumerate? Okay. Um, next. I actually say what equations we need. Prime? Okay, so think about, okay, so let's think about prime. So f of, oops, it's just. Okay, so say we have a function f of x equals x squared. What is f of x prime? What's is f prime equal to? This is basic calculus. Anyone's willing to answer? Yes, 2x. OK, what happens if we get some weird equation? Uh, delta t plus uh, natural log. <laughs> of x squared times 2u, 3z. Like what happens if we get something real nasty? But we know every value and we are, okay. So say we have this nasty equation. We're given x, we're given delta t, we're given z, and we want to find the derivative, let's, get, let's call this g of x. How do we find g prime of x? Wait, oh shoot, no. Let, let's actually, let's say u is given. And we want to find g prime of x at x. And let's say x is equal to five. What we can do is approximate the derivative at a value using the quotient difference rule. Let's see.
Does, does it, does it, do you guys know what this function is? Okay, so, like, as h gets really small, okay, let's just, okay, okay. You guys know calculus, right? Does someone not know calculus? Oh, no, here, let me ask this. Does someone not know calculus who needs this explanation? I'm, I'm very, I'm very willing to explain this. Do you guys understand this formula? You guys know this formula? Okay, never mind. Let, let me just go over it. Okay, so let's let's define a function f like f of x and return x squared. Okay, so f of zero, so f of one, f of two, let's just do f of two. We get four as expected, right? Okay, so let's take the Okay, and we know what f prime is. F, f. Let's do f of p. Okay. We found the two x because we took the derivative. We took the, it is the exact derivative. However, we can actually take the approximate derivative. So prime, let's give prime f x and add two, right? Okay, so we take that formula we saw earlier. Oh yeah, let's also define an h. And the h should be some small number. Uh, one e negative four. Um, for those doing this, if you have like lower h values, like one e to negative 10, Python doesn't really handle small values. You get really weird stuff. With it. Okay, so let's, Okay, let's see. Okay, now let's probably this prime. So prime Oops, you're supposed to uh, I don't know why. Okay, so we have a prime function. So let's let's see what the prime looks like. Of uh, okay, so you can pass in functions here. Let's call this square. What? Oh yeah. And let's pass in our function that squares our value. Then let's pass in three, and we can just, this is keyword argument, so this is optional, so we already specified it. You see that? That, isn't that cool? It is very close. We did not take the exact derivative. We got a value very close to this. So let's make an ugly function, like, Oh yeah, you can make it extra ugly. Uh, let's make it very ugly. What's an ugly function? Sign, math.sign, let's import sign. No way, no, sign is probably not good. Uh, what's an ugly, how do I make this ugly? Let's just square the whole thing. And let's make this multiply by uh, 
Oh yeah, I need port log. That's one ugly function. I don't think anyone wants to take the dirty to prove that, right? But let's see the magic of this. You see that? We found the derivative of this function at a given point using our estimation without actually having to do the math of taking the derivative of this ugly beast. So that is the power of uh, math computational estimation. And a lot of our values, they are 100% exact, but they are very close to the desired values. And we find these values using computational, uh, computational estimation. Okay, so now that we've gone over what prime, how do we take the derivative? So punch is, so prime or punch, so I just passed in like the constants along. So these are all equations from the paper. Okay, so now we have to solve this equation. Solve for B in this equation. Does anyone have a guess on how to solve for B? Okay, solving for B is actually quite tough here. Like, it's confusing. Like, like, trying to do it by hand would be impossible. And trying to derive it perfectly mathematically, like getting the exact, exact values, like, like so it's not even off by one millionth. Like, one, one to the, like, millionth, like, a very small number. However, I think something I figured out is you can subtract this over to this side and we find the root. Isn't that pretty clever? Wait, no. Okay, so, so say we have the equation like f So what we do is we subtract this thing over. So let's. So most of this paper is just solving these equations. And so what we do is C is constant. So we just plug in a bunch of values for B until we like basically what we do is a bunch, like plug in a bunch of values for B until this is very close to zero. That's basically what we do. So let's look at what, so let's look, let's look at what it looks like. So here we have a function here, right? So theta means, so what, in a function you can have constants. So like say, like f of, And C is constant, so C equals 0.5. Yeah, okay, so, so we have like F of one, F of two. So the X can change, but the C usually stays the same, okay? So that's the difference between like so this is a uh, independent variable and these are constants. F is sort of like the deep. So what we do here is we take F of B. So B is what we change. F of B plus all these constants minus B minus C. Let's see this, it's right here. It's just basically this equation. Minus B minus C. And what we'd wanna do is find the root of this func function. So what we can do is we go, usually it's supposed to be 0 0.01, 0 0.01 to 1, but I've uh, narrowed it down like ahead of time, narrowed down the range so it's pretty to look at, easier to look at. 
So what we do is we go through all these values, then we take the value that is closest to zero. And so what, let's plot it. And so let's plot it. So this is the function for different B values. This is B. Here's B, and here's the value returned by the function. So you can see here, it intersects zero. It does intersect zero. And so B at this value is the solution to the equation. And what does B mean? Okay, so B star is the value at which we want to enter the portfolio. No, it's actually the value, sorry, scratch that. It is the value that we want to sell our portfolio. And the reason we want to calculate the, this B value first is because we need to use it to calculate the D value. Okay, let's see how to calculate D. So let's add this to the notes. B equals sell. Oh yeah, these are optimal values. Okay, I have a question. Which would be higher? So given these definitions of B and D, which one would be larger, B or D? So, so here, B, is it B greater than D or? So which one is true? Which one should be true, at least? I'll give you, uh, I'll give the, people who are watching the recording like 10 seconds to answer this. Or you can pause the video if you're watching this from recording. Um, the answer is that we want to, since we want to buy low and sell high, uh, B should be greater than D. The reason is because we want to buy at a lower value than we sell. So B is greater, Okay, so B, B, so here it is around, it is around 0.5958 ish area for our uh, B value. So let's look at our D value. Oh, yeah, let's go over how. Oh, found it. We just solved this equation. And V of D uses B in its equation, which is why we need to calculate B first. I don't understand. You don't need to understand this equation. I didn't understand it, but I could still implement it to this strategy. So we do the same thing. If you remember earlier, we just subtract this over to here and we find the D value that gives us the value closest to zero, which is right here. And so you can see here, it's like around 0.45 ish area. And 0.45 is definitely smaller than the 0.5859 area. That makes sense, right? That should be intuitive. We should sell at, buy at a lower price and sell at a higher price. And let's see it in X. Okay, our uh, competition's finished. Theta mu sigma theta. Uh, oh yeah, that's fine, definitely. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll post the recording, so like, 
like I mainly ask like just to post questions. Okay, I mainly I mainly ask questions for like the people who are watching the recording. So I, I'm not asking. I'm oh, sorry. I wasn't asking you to answer like specifically. Like I sort of like just ask like uh, like I don't know. Like anyone can answer, but like it's sort of for the viewer. Okay. Um. And some of this stuff is pretty complicated, so. <laughs> okay, let's use these. Okay, so we've calculated B. Okay, so we calculated the optimal time to enter the portfolio, the optimal value, optimal time to uh, sell the portfolio. Okay, so let's turn this into a trading strategy. So here, we keep track of the here, like this is a data structure. So rolling window is basically a deck. If you are familiar with a deck, deck. Deck. Uh, max on basically means like, when you add more stuff to it, it Remove stuff. So let's add some like one, two, three, four, seven. What's the max length of uh, two? So append is basically a pen, like a pen left only deck. I think it's like some C sharp object. <clears throat> but like uh, they have these Python net to allow C sharp objects to allow Python to work with C sharp and left yeah. one. Read up and left two. So you can see here. So you can see here the most recent item is here. So sort of reverse order to what you're used to with like a list. So L equals a uh, list dot append. When you append left, it appends it to the opposite order. Here in their opposite orders, and what does max length do? Let's add, let's add another item, and let's see what it looks like after that. Oh shoot! So the oldest value one here that was added earlier, it gets booted out because it, it exceeds max capacity, and it just boots the one out. And rolling window is very similar. In fact, because rolling windows don't support Python deck objects, I actually use deck here. So. And 200 just indicates max size. Here, this is just a type. This inf indicates what type it is. So what I do is, uh, in our main algorithm, I call this update, and I update with the most recent close price for, uh, so A and B stands for the pairs we have, it pairs, and for A we use GLD, and for B we use SLV. So I just continually update it with the recent data of the closing end of day price for GLD and SLV. And I just added to this data structure, to the data structures here. And if our close A is ready, like you could, you could definitely make a case for um, saying if self dot close B, self dot close time dot is ready, if all of them are ready, However, like we, it's not new. Okay, wait. Okay, what is this app property tag? This is pretty new to me, actually. Well, it's pretty simple. It's pretty cool, actually. I've never knew about it. I've used Python for a while, but. Def bomb.
Okay, so let's just try Bob that A, right? I forgot self because it's object. We get five, right? Let's try Bob, Bob dot B. Interesting, right? It looks like a function, but instead it turns into a field. Very like a field. Like, so app property basically turns a function to make it look like a field, right? So you can see here, it looks like we're accessing a field. Um, okay. So when we do dot ready to train, we don't need the parentheses. We can just do dot ready to train and it look like a field boolean. Which, um, the reason I do this is because, like, C Sharp has a bunch of, like, getter setter things where, I mean, it's very different from Java. It, it kind of gets used, like, if you come from a computer science background who that uses, and you use Java, you usually have getters and setters, right? And, but in C Sharp, the getters and setters are sort of implicit, and that's a whole other story. But I use these odd property tags to try to match the C sharp behavior. For like the is ready. Okay, whatever. Let's just, let's not worry about that. So here what I do for training. I just reverse the oh yeah. Uh rolling since rolling windows have the data reversed, I need to like reverse the data. So let's say we have a list here, like grab my list from earlier. Okay, so we have a one, two, three, right? And let's see what Bob, so this is how you reverse something. So I reverse the data because since the most recent data is at the left, but I want the most recent data at the right because that's natural ordering, time series. That's why I reverse order. Just, so I hear, here I do is I create the optimal stopping I, oh yeah, no. Here I compute our uh, theta mu sigma, a bunch of our constants, and I feed it into the optimal stopping. The optimal stopping will compute our optimal entry and exit. And so I just create it here. So, and I also create a portfolio object, and that basically keeps track of the, our portfolio value if we held a sh dollar of stock A and short a, uh, some allocation B, like some 0.5 or 0.4 of stock B. And it just keeps, well, the <clears throat> so it just basically, so it stores the initial prices and it just computes what our portfolio value right now would look like. Well, after we like update it with new data. So we don't actually store historical data. We just like see what our portfolio value it would be from time zero. So here, like if our, if it is, if our portfolio value is below the optimal entry, less than or equal, that means we know it is an optimal time to enter. And if our portfolio is above the optimal exit, it is optimal time to sell. Okay, so in our grid, so add equity lets us subscribe to data. Okay, so some users might wonder like of Corn Connect, why do we have add equity? Well, the thing is that there are so many stock, there are so many stocks, like 6,000 plus stocks of data. So, like instead of subs instead of getting data for all the stocks and just like indexing it, instead what we do is we subscribe to the data so that we get less data to our algorithm so our algorithm runs more efficiently. So this allows us to subscribe to the data. We set warm up and that allows us our algorithm to warm up our model. Remember we need the values to <clears throat> We need to update our model with, we need to add a bunch of values and get these values full of data so that we can train our or OU coefficients 
And then so that we can compute our optimal entry and exit values. So we warm up our algorithm with 200 bars of data. And a bar is like, like OHLC feed data, open, high, low, close volume data. That's what's in a bar. So we update it. And so when we are updating our algorithm to make sh to know that we are updating, we can check if self that is warming up. It is part of the, we, like when we create out, like when we generate an algorithm, like all our algorithms extend QC algorithm. And that gives us a bunch of helper methods like self dot start, start day, set end day, set cache, bunch of these stuff. Okay, and self dot warming up tells us if we are still in the warm up process set right here. And here, uh, what, what is, so here we just train our model. So train is a specific method to QC algorithm. And we want to train at the beginning of each month at midnight. And we want to call our train model function here. What is the train model? And our model retrains our, tra retrains our OU coefficients every seven months. And I actually plot it here. And with our new coefficients, we get new optimal. We, we uh, call train on our model. And what our model, Let's see what this train do. It takes the re most recent data and recomputes the coefficients and re, okay, recomputes the optimal times to enter and exit. Okay, so why do we want to retrain our model periodically? So with an ornstein ulenberg process, it assumes our data is stationary, which means that the mu stays the same. Mu stays relatively the same. The noise stays around relatively the same. And the force at which we come back stays relatively the same. However, let's take a look at SPY. Usually the they usually the price data of uh spice dog usually usually the data if you can see here the mean usually does not stay at some value it constantly goes up so, so let's say spice stock data So it sort of looks like an exponential line, like it, sort of. That is because of the compounding effect. So the long-term mean naturally changes over time. And this is why we need to train our coefficients over time, like every, periodically, because of these changing factors. And the way to describe this is our data is non-stationary, well, relatively non-stationary. Like it is slightly stationary, which is why these co why our algorithm works. But like to account for the changing parameters over time, we need to adjust, retrain our parameters over time, and that is why we retrain our coefficients. Um, what is it? Okay, so what is okay? So this this is stationary, but something like this is not stationary. Something like this is stationary. Something like this is not stationary. Like if it just goes, keeps going down like this. And so the way we combat the non-stationary, uh, the non-stationary nature of our price data is to retrain our coefficients and our values. Okay, so we reach. So once we have the model. How, when do we buy and sell? So here, if self that portfolio invested. This is a Boolean that tells us whether we hold any stock, anything in our holdings. And if we don't, then we want to buy up the portfolio. So, and well, it tells us like part of, it is half the conditions of whether we want to buy up the portfolio or not. So if we want to enter, if we don't ha hold any stocks or anything, no bonds, no futures, no nothing, if we don't hold anything, 
and our model tells us to enter for we set 100% of our holdings long stock A. And we did here, we define stock A as GLD and stock B as SLV. We go 100% of our portfolio into A and negative, and we short negative allocation B of our portfolio and stock B or SLV. So, but how can we do this? If we allocate 100% of our portfolio, how do we still have, uh, how can we still make more investments, more positions in the stock market? Well, that is due to something called margin. And margin, or what, sometimes it can be called leverage. Well, in this case, it's not actually leverage because it is margin because we are shorting. Margin is extra cash or extra stock provided by our brokerage that allows us to take additional position. And that is why we are allowed to short money past the value of our portfolio. So we could even set this to two. We can set, oh yeah, set to, so think of like one stands for like 1.00, which equals 100%, which is why we have one here, right? So we can multiply this by two and maintain the safe ratios, but we choose not to. So let's just keep that one. Because please note that like margin does have interest rate. Like brokers aren't just gonna like lend you money and shares for free. They're gonna charge a little bit, which is why, and we want to manage the amount of risk we take on, which is why we are quite conservative with our margin. Here, LF portfolio invested. So if we are holding this portfolio that we have defined here and our model telling us to actually liquidate, hopefully that makes sense. Um, and let's run this algorithm. So we have a bunch of buttons here. Let's, so what do these buttons mean while this is loading? Build builds our algorithm. However, we usually don't need to press build because backtest automatically builds. Builds our algorithm before running it. Go live was unlike Quantopian, uh, Quantopian does not support live trading, which means you cannot actually buy and sell stock. But with QuantConnect, you can buy and sell stocks live and you can actually use this in a portfolio. See results, there's a bunch of back tests here. Uh, they are actually all the same because I ran the algorithm multiple times. They're slightly different. When I, here, like I changed the date, so the algorithm does slightly different. Okay. While this loading, uh, okay, um, for people listening, we have a Discord, we have a Facebook page, and we have uh, a mail emailing with, we have an emailing service. So if you'd like to be part of any of this, you can just put it down in the comments below. You can see our algorithm, like it doesn't make a lot of trades. The reason is because we are on a daily resolution and we have to wait a long, we might have to wait a little bit before our portfolio reaches a desired value and enter. And we have to wait time before we exit, which is why there's not a lot of trading because we don't really, we don't really buy and sell too frequently. And like once we sell, we don't buy, we might not buy for a while. Okay, let's see what, so again, about the non-stationary nature of our model, I mean, uh, of our uh, values, you can see here, it changes slightly, it changes slightly. You can see our ornstein ulenbeck coefficients evolve over time, hence the need for the retrade, for the retraining of these coefficients. Okay, let's see the, Okay, uh, often, often there's a lot, of, oh shit, 
So a common mistake is we look at the CAGR, and the compound annual growth of him, and we don't see it's too high, right? But the thing is, um, our sharp, what we, actually, what we usually want to look at is the sharp because the sharp isn't too bad. It's better than the S&P for the, over this, for the same period. Um, the reason we want to look at risk adjusted returns over just strict returns is because, let's look at a, okay. Okay, so say we have a portfolio that goes like this. And here we have a CAGR ending at this value from here to here. We have a CAGR of 20%. But it can go as low as like 40%. Does this look like a portfolio you want to hold? Probably not because if you timed it wrong and you bought it at this peak, and you're all the way down here this does not look like a very good portfolio to hold because it is very risky. The standard deviation of the returns is very high. And so the sharp would probably be very low. It'd probably be like 0.05 or something. But what happens if we look at something like this? This looks a lot more pleasant, right? The, sh the CAGR, but what happens if the CAGR was only like, 10%, but let's look at the sharp. Let's say the sharp is like 1.2. So despite it having a lower compounded annual growth return, we can actually tell this portfolio is better because it carries far less risk. And we can account for the risk in the sharp. So sharp is, so like CAGR, minus risk free rate risk free rate minus standard deviation portfolio that's good so you can see that and what we like what investments can do is to scale up and down risk instead of allocating 100 percent of your portfolio to a strategy you can scale down to limit risk you only limit half of your money so that means the amount of losses you can get is only half, but the return you can only get is half. But it is a good, it is one way to ask this. So that's just why we often want to look at sharp over just pure CAGR. And our, our sharp ratio is pretty decent. It's not the best, but it's okay. If we added a bunch of more pairs like AAPL and, um, Google, which is Apple and Google. If we added like GLD and GDEX, which is done in the paper, we can add uh, your USD and uh, JPY USD bunches. Of, like you can bat, uh, bat, you can go crazy with these pairs and model them as an OU process and make more trades. And that and with more trades, the equity curve should be smoother. There should be less drawdown. Well, like, there could be more drawdown, but, like, hypothetically, there should be less drawdown. Okay, wait, that, well, actually, let me, let me just, like, say that for another day. Okay, that is all for today's um, workshop. I hope you guys uh, learned a lot from this, and if you have any questions, just leave them down in the comments below. If you have any questions for me or from our club, uh, thank you for to everyone for coming.